Hello, everyone. Welcome. If this is your first time with us, welcome back. We're excited you're all here today for another episode of Cooking Connected. My name is Jordan. Joining me today is Snap Ed educator Dion. Hello. And we also have uh, one of our Cooking Matters volunteers, Hannah. She is going to be our moderator today. Um, and she will be helping us out with the live stream. So thank you both for being here today. We greatly appreciate that. So as per usual, uh, Cooking Matters is a collaboration between Share Our Strengths Cooking Matters program and the University of Minnesota Extension. Cooking Matters classes are in-person or online nutrition-based cooking classes that meet once a week for two hours for a total of six weeks. In these classes, a nutrition educator and a chef work together to teach our participants about how to help make a healthy, delicious, and affordable meal. Uh, today, we're going to follow a, that same format. Uh, Dion's going to be our chef, Hannah will be our moderator, and I will be our nutrition educator. And today, we are going to be making a stuffed roast squash. We'd like to thank the creators of this recipe, um, Aggie's Kitchen. Uh, please check out the description box of our video to find the link for this recipe, as well as um, a little more information. So just like every week, we do have another survey for you all to take. We love feedback from our viewers. So please, if you get a moment after this live stream, please feel free to take um, our survey again in the description box of our video. For this survey, you will need a program code, which again is in that same description box. And we'll try to throw it in the live chat as well. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dion to get started with um, our stuffed roasted squash. Excellent, thank you, Jordan. Um, so as Jordan said, we're making stuffed roasted squash and the squash we're going to use today is a delicata squash. So delicatas um, tend to have a yellow or whitish color. Um, sometimes they have orange stripes. Sometimes you'll see them um, with a little bit of a greener stripe as well. Um, but delicatas are a great squash because they are very tender. You can even eat the skin on them, which isn't the case for all winter squash. Um, and they tend to be pretty sweet and uh, a light texture. So they're a fun one to work with. Although uh, in the uh, winter time, the fall in Minnesota, there's an abundance of beautiful squash to try. So if you like this recipe, um, you could certainly substitute a different type of squash in this recipe, um, or you can use some of the same techniques we're using to stuff this squash with another type of squash. Their squash are a great thing to stuff. They almost are perfectly made for it. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, um, we always wash our hands before we start any recipe. So I've washed my hands 20 seconds, really scrubbing around your nail beds. Um, and then we need to preheat our oven. So we're going to be preheating to 400 degrees Fahrenheit today. So I've done that ahead of time. Um, and then we're going to prep our squash um, get them in the oven before we start making the filling. So we're really going to kind of cook the squash most of the way through, then add our toppings and put it in the oven to all kind of melt together. So um, this recipe requires two delicata squash. I've already got um, one prepped here and I'm going to switch my camera so that you can see um, me chopping and I'll show you how we prep another squash. All right, so we've got our other squash here. Um, some winter squash can be really difficult to cut through. They have really thick skins and you have to be a little bit careful with them um, because you don't want that knife slipping around and causing you injury or rolling your squash on the ground or things like that. Uh, luckily, Delicata um, have pretty thin skin, so we don't have to worry about that so much with them. But generally, um, it's a good idea to cut off the ends first. That's going to make it a little bit easier to work with. Just a tiny bit of the end there that I've cut off. I'm going to do the same on this side, just a little bit of the end. That's the hard part with the stem. This one is a little tough to cut through, so I'm going to cut down a little bit further. I've just cut that off. Um, and I'm going to throw these in a compost bag. And then I'm going to cut my... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jen. No, go ahead. Sorry, Dion. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to cut my squash lengthwise. So I'm going to start kind of really raising my knife up, putting the, the sharp point down. I'm going to turn it so you can see. 
and cutting all the way through. The larger the knife you have, the better. Um, earlier when I was cutting the other one, I used a 10 inch chef's knife, um, which can help you get through that if you've got a bigger knife. If you don't, no worries. Um, if we were doing something else with this squash, I might even cut it in half before I cut it lengthwise, but since we're stuffing it, I wanna leave it whole. So I'm just gonna to try to get through the whole squash at once. Um, now we're gonna scoop out the seeds and uh, squash seeds, uh, just like the pumpkin seeds that maybe your family had uh, at, at uh, Halloween time are edible, um, just like pumpkin seeds. So you can save these seeds if you want. I find that a, um, a large spoon, um, the sharper the better, can help to get those seeds out. So Dion, do you have any other suggestions? I know a lot of people um, in our classes stay away from squash, especially like a butternut squash because they're so difficult to cut. Do you have any suggestions for um, you know easier cutting of squash or is it just getting in there and doing your best? <laughs> Um, well, uh, depending on the squash and the uh, person, there are other techniques. Like I said, if you can chop it up smaller first, so like a butternut, rather than trying to go down the whole length of the butternut, which is usually a pretty big squash, you might chop, chop those ends off and then chop it in slices first, the short way. Mm -hmm. Um, you can also, um, choose a serrated knife that can help you saw more through some of those really thick squashes. Um, and then the other thing, if you really are like wanting to really get into squash and it's something that's hard for you to cut, you can purchase electric knives that will saw right through it. And um, you know, there's a, a different sort of danger with that, but they can cut really cleanly through the squash if you know what you're doing and it's, um, less force is required. So you don't have to be so concerned about slipping with that knife. Sure. Yeah, I had one of my neighbors told me that they threw their squash out in their yard one year and they had a plant the next year. So I'm tempted to do that. <laughs> yes, we reproduce readily. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I've got my uh, two squashes cleaned out here. And now I'm gonna put these on a baking sheet, no need to grease it or anything. Um, and then we're gonna have them in that 400 degree oven for about 20 to 25 minutes while we're making the rest of the recipe. Oh, and I should note, I put them um, face up in here. Squash um, can be cooked face up or face down. Um, but it, it tends to get a little bit more caramelized if you push it, put it face up. It tends to cook faster if you cook it face down. Um, oh, you know what? I forgot a step. Before I put these in the oven, I'm glad I took them out again. Um, I am going to sprinkle a little salt and pepper on them and some oil. That's going to help them cook too. So let me do that. Um, so I've just got a little bit of salt here. I'm just going to drizzle. Not much. This will kind of help add to the flavor. And then a little bit of pepper as well. And this is really a spot with the seasoning for a sub squash that you can experiment with all sorts of different flavors. Squashes um, do have flavor, but it's a flavor that goes well with a lot of different things. So you can be really versatile. Um, and then a little bit of oil as well. Just using olive oil, but you could use really any kind of oil. And a would be oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, Dion. <laughs> I'm Cooking Connected, we have done some spaghetti squash before. It's always fun to try new squash recipes. Um, I know sometimes I can be a little intimidated by the different squashes that are out there. I don't really know what to do with them, but there's a lot of different recipes out there um, to try new squashes. Uh, I had not tried spaghetti squash before that, which was kind of fun. I also really enjoy a butternut squash as well. So definitely um, this time of year is a great time to try all those squash um, options like Dion was saying. Totally. Um, so you saw there that I used a teaspoon and I spread the teaspoon 
throughout the four halves of the squash. So not a lot of oil is needed there. All right, now we have to prep the rest of our stuffing ingredients. So um, one of the things we're gonna put in is three uh, handfuls of fresh spinach. So um, I've just got a bag of, of spinach here. Um, but you do wanna turn it into some sm slightly smaller pieces, um, kind of to taste, but three large handfuls, or you could do three cups, um, but I'll call that a good handful. This is a great thing if you've got little hands helping you in the kitchen, kids love to tear things. So this could be a great job for them. Wash those hands and then um, let them at tearing the spinach. Absolutely, and I love how Dion uh, does a handful of um, spinach. We were just talking about in our last Cooking Connected portion sizes, a cup is usually about the size of your fist. So um, that's a good way to just grab a handful of spinach and have that um, cup ready, like she's saying. Yeah, I don't mean to necessarily measure this. Yeah. <laughs> and spinach is one of those that you you'd uh, have a hard time eating too much spinach. So it's great to stick in as much as we can fit into our squash. Great, and a little bit more here. And I'm not being too exacting. Um, it's not a recipe that we need to be super worried about everything cooking the same exact way. It's um, None of these ingredients are things that can't be eaten raw, um, except the squash, which we've already gotten in there. So we're okay to just kind of tear them to whatever size. What other vegetables do we have in today's recipe, Dion? We have our squash, our spinach. It looks like you've got an onion and some beans yes, there. Onion and some garlic. Um, and then, yeah, a white bean. Um, you could use a great northern kind of bean or cannellini bean. Um, but you could put uh, all different kinds of vegetables in a stuffed squash. I like to do uh, peppers, um, kale, um, zucchini. You can stuff a winter squash with a summer squash. <laughs> um, Depending on what other flavors you're doing, even something like a, a carrot that's been tenderized um, can be really delicious as well. So feel free to get creative. Um, and with the protein too, we're using um, beans today. You could use a variety of different kinds of beans. You could use um, something like ground beef or a meat replacer, um, whole variety of different things you could put in. All right, so we'll approach the onion next. I think the recipe calls for one small onion. Um, and then we're gonna just chop it finely. So I've already washed this onion. Um, I'm gonna begin by cutting off some of this top um, skin here. And that could be composted or you can also put it in a bag to keep for vegetable stock. I think we've talked about that several times. Um, cut it in half, makes it a little bit easier to peel. Jordan, what percentage of recipes do you think have an onion in them? <laughs> like 90. <laughs> Such a great way to add flavor. Absolutely. You know, sometimes I will just chop up a few onions um, and have that prep done ahead of time. Um, I find that really helpful because so many recipes do call for chopped onions or diced onions. Um, so just having that ready and on hand cuts out a little bit of the prep. Plus, I really like having um, some type of diced vegetable in the morning. Um, I'll make like a breakfast skillet with vegetables, eggs, maybe a little cheese uh, thrown in there as well. So having some prepped diced vegetables on hand can be really helpful and can save a little time. Yeah. If you know you're going to want an onion, no matter what you're making for dinner, <laughs> you really no. prep that ahead. And, and sometimes I find it easier too. If I'm already uh, have my knife and my cutting board and everything out. Um, it's a lot easier to just chop everything at once rather than 
uh, having to overcome that initial barrier of cleaning up, getting everything ready to um, chop your vegetables. Yeah. Uh, so with the onion, you saw me do the first half there, but I'm kind of following the, the parallel lines, or I'm following parallel to these lines that are already on the skin of the onion and just cutting along, but I'm not quite cutting through to the, well, I guess I did there, <laughs> but generally trying not to cut through to the root of the onion so that it all stays in one piece. I'm moving my hand around as I need to, to hold it. And then cutting in the other direction to dice the onion. All right, I'm going to put that in a separate bowl. I like to move my cutting board kind of to the end of the counter. Use the back side of my knife. You can't exactly see what I'm doing. Um, use the back side of my knife to push it into the bowl. And as Dan is saying, you can use um, onion scraps or the garlic scraps that you'll have later on um, to make vegetable broth. We bring this up, I think, every time we're on Cooking Connected. But you can make your own broth. Um, check out our YouTube channel to learn how to make your own broth. We have a quick guide on how to do that. Um, you can make your own just vegetable broth, or if you add um, like chicken bones, you can make your own like chicken broth as well. And I think we talk about how um, it's a great way to reduce sodium, but it's also delicious. <laughs> the homemade stocks that you can make are uh, a lot better than what you can get in the store. So definitely something to try. All right, our next thing is to mince a couple of garlic cloves. As Jordan was saying, this one was already peeled, but um, one way to um, easily kind of get them peeled started is to use the back of your knife to kind of press down and crack the skin. Um, if that makes you nervous, you can also use something like, um, I've seen people take, let me get it out here, um, like a Tupperware lid and use that to kind of roll it around. You can maybe even hear it kind of cracking under there. So whatever works, but you're just trying to create some friction to rub that skin off of there. And then I'm gonna put the peels um, in my stock bag over here. We've had a couple of viewers tell us that some of their kiddos will use like the bottom of a glass to smash the garlic. Um, so if the kiddos want to do that, that portion, um, again, if you're not feeling comfortable with using the back of your knife to do that, just please always make sure that your blade is facing away from you when you're doing that. Um, we've had a couple of viewers tell, that, tell us that they've accidentally cut themselves before doing that. That's no good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Got my garlic peeled. Oops, stick in the needle. All right. Um, we're going to follow a similar principle with the garlic to the onions. We're going to try to, um, you, garlic is actually in the same family as onions. So um, it similarly has those lines. They're a little bit harder to see on a garlic, but they are there. Just kind of cut it into some planks. It's a little bit hard to hold on to your garlic. We have a viewer here saying that uh, she uses a can if there's one out for the recipe. So please ah. make sure you rinse the tops of your cans. You don't want anything that's on the top of your can on your clean garlic. So just a reminder. <laughs> a little food yeah, safety. That's there. Kind of All right, kind of cutting in the opposite direction. Wants to roll away from me here. So what I'm gonna do in that case is cut it so that there's a flat surface. Now I'm gonna be able to cut that other side without it rolling away. I'm gonna go ahead and do the other one first and then I'll mince it. So some garlic from my garden. If you've got a garden space, garlic is a fun one. Um, it is planted in the fall. I don't, it's been kind of a warm fall winter, so you could maybe get away with still planting it this year, but usually it's planted around the end of October. And Minnesota actually is a great place to grow garlic, um, but we grow a different type of garlic than what you typically find in the store. Um, 
what you usually find in the store is called soft neck garlic and it keeps for a really long time, which is why you see it in grocery stores and it has a good flavor. Um, but in Minnesota, we grow a lot of hard neck garlic, um, which does not keep as long, unfortunately. Um, but it has an excellent flavor. And one of the best features about it is that it has really large cloves. So that's really nice for cooking because um, I'm sure if you've worked with a small garlic clove, you know how frustrating it can be to, to actually chop those and get enough garlic in your dish. Dion, how do you store your garlic for um, when you harvest it um, in your garden? Good question. I um, do what's called braiding, which is literally just um, taking the, so when you pull it out, it's got really long stalks on it. Um, and when they're fresh, you can twist them together in a braid and um, then hang it. And it stores pretty well, although, like I said, it just only really doesn't keep that long. So I probably won't, I don't know, in maybe a few more months, I probably will have to use it all up. So in that case, would you just maybe, would you have the option to pre-mince it and put it in a jar to store in the fridge or is that not really an option for this type Yeah, of you totally could. I think usually I just um, end up using it all, whatever I didn't plant um, and then uh, switching to store-bought garlic, but that's a good idea. Maybe I should try that. <laughs> Um, Cause that is the, the interesting thing about garlic is that to plant garlic, you plant an entire clove. Um, so as opposed to maybe a tomato plant that is gonna produce a ton of seeds, um, a garlic, you, you know, if you only get like maybe six cloves, you're planting one sixth of your product. So it can be hard to really scale up your <laughs> garlic production. <laughs> All right, so I've got my garlic here. I'm gonna do the same thing, scoop it off into a bowl. All right, I believe that we were done chopping. Let me double check our recipe here. Um, so, some of the other ingredients that we're using um, are some Parmesan cheese. So I've got a fourth of a cup of Parmesan cheese here. Um, I shredded this. I am fortunate to have an electric uh, shredder. Um, so you can use that if you've got one. If you've got a hand grater, you can do that. Um, or you can also buy it pre-shredded, although it tends to be a little bit more expensive and it doesn't last as long as if you shred it yourself. Um, so just a caution on that. We've also got a quarter cup of um, panko crumbs, or you could use just regular bread crumbs. That'll add some nice um, crunchiness to our dish. Uh, you sometimes see uh, stuffed squash with other grains, like maybe quinoa or millet, um, that can be really tasty in a stuffed squash. And then our last ingredient, like we mentioned, is the beans. So um, I just did use a can of beans, and I already opened the can. Um, and drained the beans and rinsed the beans. So that's always a good idea to get off that extra sodium that might be in the package of beans. All right, so I think we are ready to um, start cooking our stuffing. So I'm gonna try to move my camera over here so you can see my stove. Yes. And this recipe is really awesome because it, it looks like we're completely vegetarian today. Um, you can make it vegan by, you know, doing a vegan cheese if you'd like or just skipping the cheese um, so that's an awesome addition that beans that we're using is our protein today so we're still getting some protein uh, Dion said we could switch it out for a meat product if you choose to eat meat um, that's a great way to you know substitute that in, back in um, and then we can also use whole grain panko so they do have some whole grain, I guess it's whole grain breadcrumbs if you wanted to sneak in some whole grain. So a lot of opportunity to do some great substitution here and really make this recipe your own. We always talk about how recipes are frameworks. So you can really substitute this to your family's taste and what you prefer. I didn't know they made whole grain pink. I'm gonna have to look for that. <laughs> you have to look for it. It's a, it can be hard to find sometimes, but um, it is available, so. Cool. 
Um, so I put my um, pan over uh, medium heat and I put in a, tea, a teaspoon of olive oil in there. And then I'm gonna start cooking my ingredients. And the reason we do this um, rather than just putting them directly in the oven with the squash is that they just won't get the full cooked flavor if we just put them in the oven. By um, cooking them over in the pan first, we can kind of caramelize those onions a little bit and just get more flavor out of them. Um, so I'm gonna start with my onions. Oops, I got a hair though. in here. Oh, and I should check to make sure that my oil is hot. So one way to do that is just get a little drip of water on your fingers. And then you should see in here it sizzles. So then you know your oil's hot. Otherwise, my onions are just going to soak up all that oil um, and not really cook. So I'll start my onions. Um, the recipe I think says to add onions and garlic at the same time. I personally prefer to start my onions first and then add the garlic a little later because I think garlic has a tendency to burn if you put it in right away. And now is a good time while these onions are cooking to check on our squash. It has been um, uh, about 20 minutes or so, so I'm going to see how they're looking. You can see our squash here. It has changed color a little bit. It's starting to glisten a little bit with that oil. Um, and we can tell the squash is tender by pricking it with a fork. So I'll try to get this in the view and show you. So if I prick one of these, they are not quite tender yet. I can get my fork through, but it's a little bit of a challenge. So what I'm going to do in this case, since we're trying to um, get these stuffed and ready to go, is I'm going to actually flip them upside down. That's going to speed up the cooking a little bit. And um, hopefully they'll be ready to stuff sooner. Right, my onions are starting to cook down a little bit. I'm going to add my garlic in there. Like I said, garlic can burn pretty easily, so you want to just kind of keep stirring it. Smells amazing. So, <laughs> just like any time you cook onions and garlic. Mm -hmm. Definitely like one of my favorite smells in the world. <laughs> yes. And the next thing we're gonna add in um, will be our spinach. So spinach, we really just kind of want it to wilt down. You can see we have a ton of spinach here. It would not fit like this into our squash very well, but if you've ever cooked with spinach, you know that it shrinks very quickly. You can tell, um, you know, it's really a good idea to do what Dion's doing and thinking about what you're putting into your pan first. So onions go first. She doesn't want to burn her garlic, so she's putting that in next. And of course, our garlic is going to wilt pretty quickly. I mean, you can see it's already starting to shrink down quite a bit. So adding that pretty close to last if you want a little bit more bulk um, left with your spinach, but that cooks down quite a bit. Yeah, so you can see it was filling the pan and it's already shrunk down. We can see more of the garlic and onions now. And look, it looks like I barely put any spinach in there. <laughs> and the last thing we're going to add are our beans because they really just need to be heated up. We're not trying to saute them or anything. 
And like I said, I already had rinsed and drained those. And this would be a great opportunity if you did want to add any um, additional seasonings. This recipe is kind of light on the seasonings that it has you add. Oh, it's so loud over here. <laughs> Sorry if you can't hear me over the <laughs> garlic crackling. Um, so you might at this point, for instance, add a little bit more pepper. You could add, um, I like to put paprika in a lot of different things. So that might be something I would add. Um, cumin would be good with this and whatever you want. Look at this. It looks like I could almost have added like a whole nother handful of spinach. <laughs> So I think maybe I would do that if I made this again. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn off the stove and I'm going to pull out the squash again. We'll, we'll take a look on, see how they're doing. Try to move this back over so I can see my squash. As Dion was saying, you can add a whole bunch of different vegetables to this as well. Um, I, I would probably add mushrooms to this. Um, I really like mushrooms, but I mean, you can add a whole bunch of other, whatever you have on hand. I really love recipes like this because sometimes those vegetables that I'm buying, if it's at the farmer's market or even at the grocery store, they can go bad really quickly if they're fresh. Um, so having recipes like this on hand that you can throw those vegetables in can really reduce your food waste um, and you can still eat those eat those vegetables and get some good nutrients. So even just that extra minute or so of them being upside down, you can see the fork is going in pretty easily now. Um, so that's what we want to look for. And now we get to stuff them. So I'm just going to fill in um, what I can here, depending on how shallow your <laughs> Squashes, you may get more or less. If you have extra filling, um, you know, you could just have it on the side. You could save it for like an omelet in the morning. Or you could um, serve it with rice, whatever you want to do. Dion, have you ever tried this recipe with other squash varieties? <laughs> Not this specific recipe, but I love stuff, stuffing squash in general. Um, acorn squash is a really good one to stuff because it's another small one. Um, even like uh, if you wanna make a big meal, um, a buttercup squash, I like to stuff. Butternut doesn't stuff very well because it's um, so few seeds. There's not a very large uh, <laughs> hollow area. But um, any of the ones that have got a, a big spot to hollow out is good. Um, often with, uh, acorn squash, it's popular to stuff it with something like wild rice and maybe cranberries and apples. That's really delicious. Yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, you can experiment too if you like cheese, putting different types of cheese on top, um, like feta can be really good with squash. Obviously, cheese is going to add some fat, so with moderation. Um, so let me try to turn this, you can see all these squash here. Um, so I've stuffed them. And now we're gonna put on the topping, which is our panko and um, Parmesan cheese. So I'm gonna um, just mix these two together. Like I said, we had a fourth of a cup of Parmesan and a fourth of a cup of panko. This fork here still, so I'll just use that. Um, another place you could add additional seasoning. This recipe um, is, is basic and it's good like this, but like we've been saying all along, you can really experiment. And then this is just gonna go on top and that's gonna add a nice crumble. You can see I'm spilling a lot on the, um, cookie sheet here. And what is probably going to happen is that anything I've spilt is going to burn in the oven. So one good idea might be to stuff these on a separate sheet first so that you can then just put them on the cookie sheet and not have to worry about all the spillage. 
a little harder to clean off baked on stuff too. So save, save some time on dishes as well. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I have a smaller pan I can use because I've really made a mess. I think I stuffed some of these ones on the end a little bit too much, a little over full. And that's really going to depend on your squash size. So you can see it here, I have two completely different sizes of squash. And then I've got like, I grew a bunch of delicata this year. So some of them are like this size, obviously that's not going to take a lot of stuffing. Some of them are giants. So um, the squash is a pretty variable part of the recipe here. I love that little baby one. That could be like a snack or something. <laughs> yeah, it totally could. Um, you can even... Um, microwave squash. Um, like when I was in college, I used to do a lot of microwaved acorn squash. Um, I think it might be like, depending on the squash, like five to eight minutes in the microwave, cut it in half, um, poke it with a fork, put in whatever you want in there and microwave it. It's an easy lunch or whatever. All right, let me see if I can fit these in a smaller sheet here so I don't have as much of a problem with them burning. And then we're gonna put them in the oven, should take about 15 minutes or so, just to crisp up that cheese on top and um, have everything melted together in there. So I've got my squash, I'm gonna put them in the oven. Perfect. Well, while we're waiting on that cheese to brown on top of our squash, we're just going to do a little bit of nutrition education, and then we'll check out that finished product with um, Dion here. Uh, since the holidays are coming up, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about staying healthy around the holidays. Um, it can be a really stressful time, and sometimes our health or uh, things that we're eating uh, kind of get pushed to the side since we're so busy and it, like I said, it's a stressful time. So we're gonna go over some kind of nutrition tips uh, that may keep you a little healthier during the holidays. So one thing I always like to mention during the holidays is remembering portion control and moderation. Um, that can be really difficult around the holidays. Um, I know for myself, we have a lot of recipes that I love and I only get around the holidays. So that's might not be something that I want to um, compromise on all the time at every holiday party, but there is a lot of holiday parties sometimes if we're going to multiple in a week or um, even a few in a month, it can really add up. So some things that um, easy things that you can do during these holiday parties, if you're planning a meal, you can start to find healthier alternatives some, for some dishes that maybe don't matter as much to you. So for instance, in my family, we make Swedish meatballs every Christmas. I'm not willing to compromise on that, but we do have um, like oh, sweet potatoes. So, and that's not something that I really enjoy and my family just kind of likes it on our table. Um, so that's a dish that maybe I could find a healthier alternative for a really great healthy alternative for something like that could be like the, um, we had made a sweet potato and apple bake a couple weeks ago on cooking connected. Now that can be kind of dessert or it can be kind of a substitute for those really sweet, sweet potatoes. Sometimes people put, um, marshmallows on the top of those. So maybe finding some healthier alternatives for some of those dishes, if you're planning a holiday, um, party. Some other things if you're attending a holiday party is using a smaller plate if it's available. Um, sometimes if uh, you have a really big plate, you're tempted to fill that plate up and kind of, you know, fill all of that space. But if you have a smaller plate, it kind of tricks your mind into thinking that you have more food than you actually have. Um, and it kind of keeps you um, honest with your portion sizes a little bit. So having a smaller plate is always a good idea. Um, for that, you just can't fit as much food on there. You can also start with more nutrient dense, nutrient dense foods when you start to eat at these meals. So for instance, you might wanna start with your vegetables on your plate. Um, we're still keeping in mind, of course, my plate, trying to fill our plate with half fruits and vegetables. Eating those vegetables first, it'll help make you feel a little fuller. Um, and then you can eat the kind of the um, less healthier things or maybe more calorie dense things after you eat your vegetables. So that's always a good idea too. 
Something else to think about is eating mindfully, slowing down a little bit. Sometimes, I mean, during the holidays, we're socializing around food. So make sure you focus on your food a little bit too. Um, if you can get away from socializing around food a little bit, that's always a good idea. But sometimes we just kind of forget that we're eating while we're talking around the table and we can really start eating that food really fast and forget how much we're eating. So eat mindfully, slow down a little bit. Um, some people will put their fork down in between bites. It does seem like a lot of work sometimes, um, but sometimes that's having that little reminder to just slow down a little bit can be really helpful. Um, it does take about, about 20 minutes for your brain to realize that you're full. So if you're eating really, really fast and you've ever just kind of sat back after a little while and realized, oh my goodness, I'm so full. That's why it just takes a little time for your brain to catch up and realize that you're full. So make sure you give yourself that time. So if you're going to be going back for seconds, try to take a small break. Um, that can be something really easy for you to do um, to try to not eat as much on the, around the holidays is if you're going back for that second portion, take a small break, 15, 10, 15 minutes to let your brain kind of catch up and understand if you're full or not. And of course, if you're still hungry, go back for, for the food that, that you're wanting. Um, some other things to, of course, keep in mind, as I said, the holidays can be a stressful time. So we're still considering, you know, maintaining physical activity. That's a really important thing that we should always be doing is trying to stay physically active. Um, it's recommended about 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So it's like 150 minutes for the week of physical activity. One way you could do that is maybe going for a walk after you eat that big holiday meal um, or consider socializing again away from food. During the holidays, it can be uh, eating a lot of meals together as a family, which is great, um, but sometimes you're socializing around food and again, forgetting how much food that you're eating. So maybe spending some fa uh, quality family time around other things, um, perhaps decorating a tree or going outside and having a walk. Um, as Deanne was saying, it's unseasonably warm right now. So uh, we can still walk around a little bit um, before snow hits, knock on wood. <laughs> And of course, uh, during the holidays, making sure you're staying hydrated and sleeping. Again, it's a stressful time um, during these, this time of year. So just make sure that you're keeping your health at the forefront of your mind still. So with that, Dion, how's our squash looking? Yeah, I can pull it out here in one minute. I just wanted to add, because I think you had a lot of great tips. One of my struggles around the holidays or even like around Halloween time is, is that there's a lot of sweets around and they get left out or maybe my aunt makes cookies and there's displays all over the place of these beautiful cookies. And so I think we tend to graze without even realizing it. So I've learned that I just have to keep those things in a cupboard. And if I want them, um, it's more of making a, um, a real choice about going for those instead of just grabbing them because they're convenient and and insight. <laughs> Absolutely. That is such a great point. Um, especially when I'm planning for, you know, healthy snacks and stuff, make your healthy snack, the easy choice and those less, less healthy options. You want to make a little more difficult to get to. So I like to say, I lean into my laziness. A lot of times I'll put the less healthy snacks at the back of the cupboard. So I have to like get up on the, <laughs> the little step stool and go to the back of the cupboard to grab my cookies or something like that. Um, sometimes that'll prompt you not to eat those less healthy snacks because they're not quite as convenient. Totally. <laughs> uh, so I'll show you, I think they need a little bit more time in the oven. Um, oops, but here's what we've got so far. And you can, it's hard to tell maybe in the picture, but there are some spots where the cheese is starting to brown a little bit and where it's starting to melt. So that's kind of what you want to look for. This one is particularly melty. Um, and if you do have like slightly more stuffed into some of them, they might take a little bit longer than others. Um, but basically you're just looking for melted cheese that's a little bit crispy on top, almost like if you were making a pizza. Um, so I'll probably get, put them in a few more minutes. Uh, another great thing that I didn't mention about stuffed squash, especially if you're stuffing a small squash like a delicata or uh, an acorn squash is that they are really great in the fridge. Um, they'll last for a few days and you can um, cool them down and then 
wrap them in um, plastic wrap or aluminum foil or a Tupperware too. Um, and then they're an easy to, to reheat lunch option. Um, you can have your protein, your vegetables, your whole grains all in one little package that's easy to transport. So that's one thing I like about stuffing squash as well. Absolutely. Yeah, the squash look beautiful. Thank you so much, Dion. That's such a great recipe. Yeah, it's a fun thing to experiment with too. Absolutely. Well, with that, we can go ahead and let you all go. I know we're a little over time, but thank you again, Dion, for that beautiful recipe. Um, we're, it's, I'm excited to try some squash recipes now. <laughs> We'd also like to thank, again, the creator of this recipe. This is Aggie's Kitchen. Please check out the description box for uh, the link to the recipe, as well as our survey and uh, survey code. So if you have a minute after this live stream or after you watch this video, please go ahead and take that survey for us. It just helps us make our videos a little bit better each time. So we really appreciate that feedback. Uh, we'd also like to thank our Cooking Matters volunteer, Hannah, for joining us today as a moderator. We greatly appreciate your help and we always appreciate our volunteers. So with that, we hope to see you back again next week. Um, next Thursday at 2 p.m., we will have another live stream. That will be our last, um, well, I guess it will be our last video of the year, and then we'll be taking a small break during the holidays. So we hope to see you back again next Thursday, um, again, next Thursday at 2 p.m. With that, we'll go ahead and let you all go. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you.